Hello, my name is Mark Allen Derry. I'm an infectious diseases physician and epidemiologist here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Despite significant progress in HIV prevention and treatment, disparities persist across different populations. This roundtable that we are going to have today brings together distinguished HIV experts and stakeholders to examine the complex factors driving these inequities and explore strategies to promote health equity. By fostering open dialogue and collaboration, we aim to identify actionable steps to address HIV disparities and ensure access to quality care for all affected communities. The insights and perspectives that our experts will provide here today will be invaluable in shaping a more just and inclusive response to the HIV epidemic. And with that, let me please introduce our panelists today. First up, Dr. Sneha Jacob is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Rutgers University, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, as well as an HIV specialist with a background in internal medicine. And Dr. Hamadullah Sheikh is an Assistant Professor in Infectious Diseases at Rutgers University, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, and is Associate Chair for Infection Prevention at Robert Wood Johnson. Please, let's give our panelists a warm welcome. But I do want to address something about uh, uh, that, that you said that um, that you don't do telemedicine. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about why, because for me, telemedicine has become a huge boon in my practice. And, and in fact, I'm in the middle of telemedicine clinic right now. We just had to put it on hold uh, so that we could we could actually do this. But I, I'm super curious, Dr. Sheikh, why why is telemedicine not something that you are uh, um, uh, able to do or you're not doing? You're not practicing, rather. Yeah, uh, and you know, I, I, and you know, I'm not against telemedicine. I love it, right? It's, it's great, uh, especially for the patients. Um, it's just that with, uh, with my prep patients. I mean, first and foremost, my prep patients, until and unless the patient, you know, really wants the telemedicine, that's okay. But, uh, for prep, I really want them to come in at least for their SCD test. Right, there is. I have to get the SCD testing, and a lot of the times the patients are surprised themselves. Right, so for prep, I I tell I I mean I I don't I don't uh, I I just you know make fun of them. I was like, hey, listen, I can't really give you the pill if I don't see you. So you know that that scares them a little bit. I mean that's not true, but uh, entirely true. But uh, you know obviously I have to see them in person just to make sure I I I treat them as a whole. With HIV patients, yes, I mean. If I if I have an HIV patient who's been you know with our clinic for years and years and years, telemedicine fine, right? I I know they're compliant. I know they're not going to divert away from uh you know um uh, of not uh, they won't basically not so they won't stop taking their medication. But for the for most of them, I think it just creates a, a good chemistry. It creates a good rapport. It it it's it's more for me. It's more meaningful to see them in person. It's it's just to hear about them, just to see how they're doing with their pills, um, any any issues that they've come across, any anything that they just want to tell me, um, and that's oftentimes you know over the telemedicine, it's not entirely possible. I think because sometimes you know the sound isn't working, sometimes the video isn't working, sometimes you know they have other things going on at the house, at the clinic is just me and them one-on-one. -on -one. And I think it just creates a much more meaningful physician and patient relationship that I think contributes to the longevity of the relationship. That, that, that's amazing. Um, Dr. Jacobs and, the, and Dr. Jacob, same question. And then I, I, I'm i going to just share with me my, share with you guys my experience as well. Yeah, I've actually had a great experience with telehealth, and it, it, I think it's one positive thing that came out of the pandemic. Um, prior to that, right, the insurances were not covering. And I think it's so critical and helpful for them that they're covering not just video visits, but telephone visits, because there are times where the telephone visit, if I'm giving a um, a positive uh, sexually transmitted infection call about um you know, we need to treat you and let's talk about partner treatment and partner notification. I mean, I think, you know, it doesn't always require a video. It's just something which we need to sort of get the information out, discuss any issues. Um, but but yeah, I think there's a place for video. There's a place for telephone. But I think either way, the convenience for both the patient and the provider is great. Um, sometimes it can be worked into the provider's day when you're not in obviously a physical clinical session. You don't need the physical space with the with the patient rooms, especially when that may be um, 
not always accessible. And um, I do find for my patients who work, it's been so useful because a lot of them scheduled the telehealth during their lunch break. And so oftentimes I can see, and, and we have many patients who are working in local warehouses, factories, restaurants. Um, and so I can sort of see their background and I can see them step out. Sometimes they step into the bathroom. But I, I know that if we didn't have telehealth, we couldn't even have that visit. And so I think it's been a huge, um, a huge progress um, for, for the field of medicine. And, and I hope it stays. I hope it's something that insurances will continue to cover. Agreed. Agreed. My experience has been very much like yours, but I want to add to it and tell you something cool that our state has done. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Gee, was the, um, uh, who's a colleague, uh, was the health commissioner for the state uh, during uh, Governor John Bell Edwards' uh, first um uh, first session uh, as governor, and uh, she did something incredible. She was like, I want to solve one big problem. She went around the state. She listened to people, and she's an OBGYN by training. What did she get out of it? She got out that if I could figure out how to cure everybody of hepatitis C, that would leave that would be impactful and at the same time would leave an incredible legacy for her. She pulled together a couple of ID doctors, myself included. We put together a five-year program in which we refer to as the Netflix model. And so what happened is that essentially uh, uh, she put out an RFP, uh, essentially Gilead basically won the contract in which they created kind of a, a, a spinoff drug. Uh, and we have it for five years and that five years is coming up actually. And, uh, and unfortunately it's not, I don't know if it's going to be renewed or not, but in those five years, we had unlimited, uh, access to Eclusa was the medication that it was called. And there was never a denial, never denial. It was like Netflix model, like I said. And so just like you subscribe to Netflix, you can download as much as you want in a month. Right? So for five years, we had, we had a complete, um, uh, uh, unmitigated reign of this medication that really saved, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands of lives. The reason why I'm bringing it up is that I probably did hundreds of calls with people in rural Louisiana. I never saw them. I never touched them. I, I don't even know their faces, but just telephonically, I was able to review their labs, show that they had a detectable viral load, show that they uh, needed to be on it, and then six, you know, follow them once or twice in the three months that we were seeing them, follow them six months later to tell them they had an SVR, and if they very rare cases they didn't, then we would do it again. But just doing it through the telephone, talk about removing barriers. That was really an incredible experience, especially during uh, COVID. Uh, and so, yeah, so unfortunately, COVID really made the program very difficult because people weren't going to the offices, they weren't getting diagnosed, what have you. But that that was my incredible uh, experience. I do want to summarize some of the themes that I think I heard today. Um, HIV continues to disproportionately impact marginalized communities, and we talked about that, uh, and particularly racial and ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, and those with low incomes. Um, despite the advances, and there have been incredible advances in treatment and prevention, significant disparities unfortunately continue to persist in HIV incidence, prevalence, and access to care, specifically amongst health outcomes uh, within these groups. And we did talk about that, and you guys spoke about that very eloquently. These disparities are driven by complex intersecting social determinants of health, which was, we discussed, uh, including poverty, stigma, discrimination, lack of access to health care, and systemic barriers rooted in structural racism and inequities. And it, just hearing about all three uh, of your uh, uh, systems, the hospitals and the clinics that you work at was really incredible and very inspiring for me and really gave me some ideas that I could go home and work with. But lastly, addressing HIV disparities requires, as we all know, multi-level tailored interven uh, interventions that not only target individual risk factors, but also the underlying social and structural drivers enabling these inequities that continue to persist, which is something that's near and dear to my heart, and calling it out. And that involves increasing access to culturally competent prevention and care services, combating HIV-related stigma, addressing the social determinants of health through policy changes, and actively engaging affected communities in research and program development to assure 
uh, equity and, and of course, relevance. So Dr. Jacob, I can't thank you enough for really being a tremendous participant here. Your insights were really wonderful. Uh, Dr. Sheikh, really incredibly eloquent the way you spoke about the way that your clinic system works and how you address these issues. I, I have learned quite a bit from, uh, from you two and of course from Dr. Gandhi as well. Thank you guys very much for participating in this incredibly important program.